Uh, so, role of habitat in fisheries conservation and management. Um, I am obviously, my name is John Spurgeon, and I'm new. Um, I think I've met every single one of you. You know that I'm new. Um, my role here will be um, establishing um, kind of a research agenda in fisheries habitat management conservation and what that role of habitat is for fish populations across the state and, and the region and country and what have you. But uh, so I am uh, a little different than the aquaculture side of the house. I, my focus is on uh, sport fish populations, uh, native fishes, fishes of conservation concern, and those are all things we'll kind of hit on today. So there is a diversity of habitats and a diversity of fishes. So what I want to do right now is this is kind of cool because I know all of you guys can do this. Um, I want you to get into little groups of two people and think about the number of fish that, write down as many or think about as many fish species as you can possibly think of. This is going to be cool because I know you guys come with a lot of them. Um, in, in, in the state of Arkansas. <laughs> all right. You're out of species? Good. I'm, you probably beat me too. Um, so I'm new here. Uh, all right. This side of the house. How many have you come up with? And give me a couple of examples. We came up with 563. <laughs> <laughs> catfish and channel catfish. Catfish and channel catfish? Blue catfish. Okay, catfish. I was like, wait, wait a minute, Anita. <laughs> <laughs> so you just said catfish. I was like, what? <laughs> All right, so we've got 563 different species over here, oh. and two fish that didn't surprise me, the, the, the two that she came up with, blue catfish and channel catfish. What's over here? long ear sunfish and orange spotted sunfish. Nice. Now we're starting to get a little bit kind of my, my world. Um, how many species do you think there are in the state of Arkansas? Roughly 200. <laughs> Roughly 200. <laughs> yeah. What do you think over here? Roughly? Instead of 500. Yeah, that's what it is. I'm thinking of the fishes. Yeah, fishes are hard. I would say there's probably 1,200. 1,200? Yeah. No. No, there's, there's roughly, there's a little over 200 species, different species in the state of Arkansas. It's not fair. I teach a class. I, yeah, I kind of got it. Yeah. And I have the book and read through it this morning to make sure I figured that number out because um, I didn't know either. You can come on in if you'd like to come in. You're fine. You're fine. Wait another one. Um, so uh, yeah, there's a great diversity of fishes. Now I want you to think about diversity of habitats. So name as many habitats as you can think of. So get back into your groups and name as many fish habitats that you can think of. All right. Now give me a few habitats from the side. Rivers. Rivers. Ponds, lakes. Okay. Anything else? Ripple streams. Yeah. Ripple streams. Ripples and pools. So we're talking a lot about some geomorphology stuff and there's some big landscape features such as rivers and streams. <coughs> Anything over here? Reservoirs and caves. Caves and reservoirs. Okay. So you guys have all been thinking of fairly large scale. What about some smaller scale um, habitats that may be important? I say rivers, but what about river? Is there are there habitats within a river? Yeah, you got your spillways, you got your points, you got your brush piles. So there's some physical habitat within a river, right? And so you got a brush pile. What else do you have? Go down, go down in scale a little bit more. Individual rocks, interstitial spaces within within a, within a, within a, a substrate, right? Those are habitats. So one thing that I wasn't going to say, but now I can, rivers and streams and lakes and habitat for fishes is very hierarchical in nature. So you got to keep that in mind too. They build upon each other and processes that occur at small spatial scales and temporal scales lead up to be um, larger scale um, functions, big habitats. So this is an example of three different fish species that I have worked on throughout the time. Um, one is the humpback chub. It's an endangered ciprinid. It's a minnow species. Um, in the Grand Canyon, it is endemic. And uh, endemic means that it only occurs in that one given location. So um, this is endemic to the Colorado River Basin. Um, and so it is, and this is, if you didn't know what I'm talking about, it's right here. We've got this kind of odd-shaped hump, which is actually pretty prevalent in uh, a lot of the Gila uh, genus species, uh, Gila uh, genus in uh, the Colorado River. Um, and that hump 
aids it in surviving in its habitats. Um, this, is the, this is actually a small creek called Shinamu Creek. Uh, it's a tributary of the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon. And what we did here was we took these little critters out of their, their habitat where they do well in, and we put them in these new habitats and see how well they did. And so we did the kind of habitat, they call it translocation. Um, here's another example of a different, the very different habitat. And this is um, uh, the Red River of the North. This is in Manitoba, Canada. I've done some work there with these monster channel catfish. Um, not unheard of, and you guys can kind of picture this, not unheard of for these catfish to reach 800, 900 to over a meter long. Um, and for a channel catfish, that's huge, uh, as you guys all well know. Um, these fish are, are actually um, 20 to 30 years old, a lot of them are, when they get this big. Um, so they've reached um, very old ages <coughs> and very large sizes. And we do a lot of work with uh, understanding their growth dynamics and how it varies compared to maybe the southern populations. And lastly, I've done, um, here's some lakes. We, we talked about lakes a while ago, and these are different habitats and lakes and crappie populations. Uh, we've done a little bit of this, but this is, this is actually, I wanted to highlight this as part of course development, which is what I will be doing here as well. Um, and so I've, I've enjoyed working with students on these types of environments, and these are really nice areas to work with students and, and develop kind of habitat relationships and programs and, and what have you. But anyway, so there's a lot of diversity in habitat, a lot of diversity in habitat types, and a lot, a lot of diversity in fishes. Um, so, my role here at UAPB will be to develop research on habitat management. How do we, how do we manage habitats in, in rivers and lakes and, and streams and what have you, um, bayous? Um, how do we do those things um, to help fishes and the diversity of fishes that we have? Um, so, one thing would, I would potentially do would be prioritize habitat management projects. So can we come up with a, a, a scheme to which we uh, develop indices that says this habitat is worse than this habitat and can we then um, focus our efforts or will we get the most economic, for instance, bang for our buck if we focus on this habitat versus another habitat? And can we prioritize those habitats across the state for, for management? Um, and one thing I'm really interested in is increasing the understanding of how fish respond to habitat management. So if we do some local scale brush pile improvements, what is that having at the population level? Um, so another thing, uh, enhanced learning opportunities for students in habitat restoration and fishing colleges. This will be done through like course development, developing a course where we have students um, participate in maybe different pedagogical or learning philosophies such as active learning where they have to get out into the field, partner with our agencies like USDA and NRCS and say, uh, we want our students to come out in the field, learn these techniques with you and uh, that way they're better prepared to jump in the job market and, um, and, 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 and take off and have an understanding of what the complexities are in restoration ecology. Um, and providing information to the stakeholder and habitat users. Scott will be talking a lot about pond management um, in a little bit, but um, my job here would also be to, to help if anything need, if anyone needs help on, say, ponds or rivers or lakes or any kind of habitat program that they or habitat initiative that they wanted to start, I could help be a sounding board for that. So habitat management. Uh, to me, this is kind of a quick, dirty, um, real condensed uh, conceptual idea that I have. In order for you to understand habitat management, you have to understand what, it, what is habitat. We've kind of briefly discussed that. Um, we have to understand what do habitats do? What is the role of habitat for fish population dynamics? And has anyone heard of fish population dynamics? What I mean by dynamics and demographics and things like that, okay? Um, so demographics would be uh, population change. So in humans, we have a census every 10 years, um, but in fish, we don't, we don't have such a, a nice way to estimate population size and abundance. And so we have to go out and find different ways to, to measure those things. But anyway, that's what I mean by population demographics, is the change in, in things like growth rate, the change in things like population um, survival, and things like that. So do habitats have an influence on those demographic parameters? And then lastly, you have to understand how habitats change as well. So here's my definition of habitat. Um, it's, and we could spend all day on this one definition, just, just breaking it down and describing it. But my definition of what a habitat is, is an adequate abiotic, which abiotic means things that aren't living. So like um, substrate, rocks, gravel, sand, water, uh, trees, uh, ambiotic conditions, uh, other predators in the system, um, 
algae, algae growth, uh, phytoplankton, what have you, the production of the system, um, and interactions in the food web. So those conditions have to be, have to be there, um, have to be sufficient enough, so that's where that adequate comes in. So they have to be in great, great, great enough abundance and distribution, um, say within a lake, um, to help a species complete all uh, of its life history. What do I mean by life history? Well, life history, I mean, has to be able to spawn. Those eggs have to be able to, to survive. And so that's a, those are two different life history stages, so spawning, but then also survival of eggs. Um, growth, so they have to be able to grow. So you have to have the habitats that are allow those fishes to grow. Um, and then you have to have um, uh, movement. So movement would be uh, two different habitat types. So all these habitats have to be, have to be there to facilitate those life history strategies. And that has to occur within a generation of a, of a population or the lifespan of an individual. And so all those things have to result in fitness. And fitness is that basically the ability then to pass on their genes to a, a, new, set of, um, a new, new set of individuals. So examples of habitat that we discussed earlier, and we'll kind of reiterate here. There's, I, I think of habitat um, not so much at the scale that you guys were thinking of in terms of those larger scale things. Um, like rivers and streams and stuff like that, those big geomorphological changes in the landscape. But I think of them as substrate, um, wood, and then also water. Water is a critical habitat component for fishes. And so it spans the physical, chemical, and biological component of systems. That's what I think of from our definition. That's what habitat is. Um, and so what might all this wood do? This is a lake in Wisconsin. What might all this wood, what might, what might the role of this wood be, this, these logs, um, for fish? How can we link those logs to fish? Shade? Shade? Shading? So microclimates, temperatures? Yep. Cover. Mm. Cover from like, predation. <laughs> so it helps for like a refuge. OK. Yeah. So growth, bacterial growth, especially the bacterial food web. It's really important in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, those are all things that, that they do, that it, that it does. Those are all important functions of wood in these big streams or these big lakes. Um, here's another example here at home. This is Collins Creek. Um, this little area right here, this is all a, a gravel substrate. And what might gravel, what, what important part of a fish's life strategy, life history strategy, might gravel play? Funny. We've all heard Doug's talks, I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there, um, and you can see right here, this, this is a red. This is a red in a, in a small creek. And what reds are is that fishes um, dig out these systems and uh, deposit their eggs in here. So now that he left, we can, I can talk, I'll just talk about that anymore. Okay, so here's something, that, uh, here's something that Doug came up with. And he saw this uh, a couple weeks ago, which is really cool. And I don't know if you guys have seen this or not. I don't want to steal Doug's thunder, but um, I was out with him when we were digging through some of these reds to see if we could see some viable eggs. And uh, these are brown trout reds. And then you can't see it real well, but these two little eyes, it's an eyed egg. Um, and so we were able to dig down into these reds, and probably six or seven inches down into the substrate, and we started to find viable, or <coughs> I, I use the word viable loosely here, but eggs. And they weren't, uh, they weren't dead, which is great, right? Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and so what do habitats do? Well, they, like we know, we've already talked about it. They provide that refuge um, from environment and predators, such as these little eggs. Um, they provide spawning habitat for the adult fishes. Um, and they provide conditions for growth. So once these little guys leave, they'll be in the interstitial space. They'll be able to sit there, absorb their yolk sac, and potentially when they swim up, they'll find habitats that they can use to grow for uh, until they get eaten by bigger fish. But, Okay, um, how do habitats change? This is one thing I'm really interested in. Um, they can change through natural, natural processes, um, such as erosion and sedimentation. Anyone who has a farm, a creek that runs through their farm, understands erosion occurs and habitat, your stream habitat looks very different after a, a rainstorm than it did before, right? So they'll change at a small scale, but also change at very large scales. And so one of those large scale changes would be example of a river. And this is a meandering river system. Um, and these little backwater areas here are old channels. And so these are called oxbow lakes. And the process of sedimentation and erosion will eventually connect this, and this will now become a new lake, unless we put structure there to prevent that from happening. So 
and like the process of wood and, and, and decay. Um, that picture I showed you earlier with the, um, uh, the lake, that wood will eventually decay. And if new wood does not fall into the, the lake, then you have the change in habitat. So it also changed through human manipulation. Um, some of these can be similar to um, natural processes like sedimentation, but often they occur at much faster rates. Um, and we can also create very unique and novel systems where we have completely different habitats than what would have been occurred on the landscape naturally, such as reservoir systems. When you block a river, um, it looks very different than what it would have normally looked like. That's in Arkansas. Uh, so habitat management. We talked a lot about what habitats do, do habitats change in their function, but what do we, when we talk about habitat management, um, why do we do it? Well, we do it so we can sustain benefits that we have from ecosystems or ecosystem services we've all heard of, such as clean water, um, productive fisheries. And we can have multiple goals, um, and these are just two of them. You can actually, you, you, one of your goals for habitat management can be um, restoring a habitat, restoring a system. Um, it's very difficult to do. For one, we don't know what we're going to restore it to. What, do you, what, what set of processes are you trying to revert that habitat back to? 10 days ago, 300 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 5 million years ago, what have you. So that's a very difficult process to do. And basically what restoration is, again, you're, you're trying to get all ecosystem processes, such as nutrient cycling, um, flow patterns, flow regimes, all that kind of stuff. The input of wood into a system. You want, you're trying to get all of those components back to a natural process that occurred maybe before human settlement, which is very difficult to do. Um, but we can also do rehabilitation. This is the term that I typically use more than restoration. And that rehabilitation is you're reestablishing some of the ecosystem processes, but to me it's uh, more active and um, adaptive management of, of systems where you're going, you Say you have a, a sedimentation, we talked about sedimentation. If you have a, a riffle in a creek and that riffle is being sedimented in, well, you can take instruments out and blow the sediment out and hopefully you get fish to come back and spawn and use those areas. So you get maybe a, a short-term benefit to restoring the habitat. But the processes such as sedimentation from the watershed will eventually sediment that um, riffle back in. So you have to go back and do it again. But rehabilitation would be a short-term fix, at least for a little while. Um, when we do habitat management, we have a habitat technique. I just mentioned one. Can you think of another technique that we would do to, to rehabilitate a habitat? Toss some big logs in the stream. I like logs. That's what we do a lot. So we're going to put some logs in the stream. And so we have this technique right here. And we want to, our, 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 our thinking is, is we put that log in the stream, where, what are we doing? We're doing physical manipulation to the system. We're putting something in. And we'll, so here we went down this path on this little conceptual model. Now, that physical manipulation of the stream, we're thinking that it will indirectly lead to a fish community response, such as habitat for growth. Um, but also, it could lead to water quality improvement through decreased sedimentation and things like that. So you have direct effects that a habitat technique, a, re a rehabilitation technique can do, and you also have indirect effects that um, you, when you're planning these things, that's what you're ultimately trying to do. You're trying to conceptualize how your technique will directly affect something, but also have an indirect effect. So my example today is going to be reservoirs. Um, we have a lot of reservoirs in this state. Um, that's a bit majority of water bodies that we have, that we have a few natural lakes. Scott, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but mainly those are oxbow lakes along our big river systems. But majority of our lakes are some form of reservoir system, where a reservoir is something that has been blocked. It's a river, a stream that has been blocked, and it backs flow up. Um, and that's, you have different structures that allow a release of water, but in, in uh, the simplest term, a reservoir is something that has just blocked flow. And so you got this impoundment of water. And these are very novel systems because you have both processes that occur in river systems, such as high sedimentation, um, high erosion, things like that. But you also have processes in lakes, such as uh, stratification and things like that, which all influence your fish populations. Um, and we have, a, we have our biggest issue then is because because of those those multiple processes that occur in reservoir systems, we have this idea of functional age versus chronological age. 
I'm getting older. I, I know I don't feel like I did whenever I was 10 years, ago, 10 years younger. Um, so I'm getting older from chronological age. Um, but uh, sometimes my chronological age, I'm doing this on the fly, by the way, my chronological age does not necessarily uh, reveal my functional age. So when I go out and I run two miles, I feel much, much worse than the 30-year-old should because I'm out of shape, or 34-year-old should. So that functional age, I don't have the function anymore that I used to. Even though I, I, I'm chronolog chronological age, I'm still pretty young and I should be able to do these things. Uh, functionally, I'm just not very good at them anymore because I stopped running. Same thing in reservoirs. You can have a reservoir that's 50 years old, but that's not that old. But really, it's like 200 years old because of the high sedimentation that it's had. It's had a decay of, of wood. There is no more habitat left in this thing to support fisheries. Now, it could still support other ecosystem services that we rely on, such as drinking water and things like that. But even those will be diminished, too. And typically, it's when we talk about things that happen at a much faster rate, this is what we're talking about. Reservoirs uh, change at a much faster rate than, say, a natural lake would, where it takes millennia, thousands of years for a lake to change from a, from a, from a, from a, a lake compounding system to maybe a marsh or wetland. Or here's it can happen within 50 years. So um, when we think about the aging process of lake, we talk about functional versus chronological age. Whenever you initially impound a flowing water, water comes up, it fills backwaters, it fills tributaries, it fills um, flooded timber, uh, it floods timber. And so you have this spike. And say this is time and this is amount going up. And this is some desired quantity. So we're, we're going to use wood because we all, we all like um, putting brush piles and stuff like that in trees. That's something we can tangibly conceive. And so whenever you initially flood a, 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 a river or impound a river, all of a sudden you've got this massive quantity of wood that's flooded and available for fish to use. Well, um, through time, coming on here, that wood starts to decay, and it starts to fall, and it starts to rot, and it starts to go away. And so sooner or later, you're going to have a decrease in the amount of wood in a lake. And so at that point in time, when you get to this minimum desired quantity of wood that you want in a lake, you've got to make a management action. You've got to say, I'm going to do something different, because I want to produce more fish. I'm going to put more wood in the lake. And so you go out and you dump a bunch of brush piles in the lake, and then you pop it back up for a little while. And then those processes innate in reservoirs will eventually um, cause that wood to, to decline again. So this is where management really is, this is kind of the focus of, of kind of what I think about, is what can we do to really amplify this and to sustain it and for, for uh, fish populations. Is that clear? Coach, we're good? Yeah. So, wood. We can use natural wood, or what, natural wood. <laughs> <laughs> natural material, such as trees and things like that. And this is an example of Arkansas Game Fish, who work very hard at this, um, to plant um, trees and brush and things like that into their, their systems. And it's just a big, big, uh, these are just Christmas trees, and it's a big pontoon. They just push them off in different areas. Um, and you can do this in a very systematic way, or you can do it fairly randomly, too. They also use uh, plastic structures that you know, may last longer. But the you know, question that I may have is, what is the, is, is, are the relative benefits the same using both these different structures? Do they produce the same amount of food for a lake? Do they last the same amount of time? Probably not. Um, are there pollution issues, microplastics? Mm -hmm. See, I listen to you every once in a while. Um, and so you can find all of this stuff um, where they've planted these things. Um, you can find all the locations of the fish habitat additions at this website at Arkansas Game of Fish. Um, they actually say where they go and put uh, these habitat structures so you can go and catch fish. And so their main idea for habitat management in doing this is to um, attract anglers to fish. So that's another important part of uh, habitat management is that human dimension side of it getting people close to the resource, fish, and understanding, um, and how can they catch more fish and have a better time, which then they want to come back. So this may have nothing to do with a fish population demographic. That's, that's kind of the million dollar question that I've kind of had. We're, we're doing this more so for attracting anglers 
or are we doing this, are we actually making a, an impact on the fish population? That's how you can do it, do it yourself habitat. Um, this is, the, is kind of like the Cadillac, and I don't know if Scott will talk about these at all or not, but this is to like the Cadillac, this is crazy. These are made in Arkansas. They're made up in the northwest uh, part of the state, I think, and they're called Mossback Habitats. This is their Trophy Tree XL kit. I think it's three kind of stalks with a bunch of plastic limbs coming out of it. Um, these are made in a way that they're supposed to really promote production, uh, phytoplankton growth and stuff like that, but they're 800 bucks. So you can do it yourself a different way. Um, your Christmas trees. You can spend zero dollars on a Christmas tree if you not, I'm not saying go poach Christmas trees, but if you can get, you can get one for zero dollars or you can spend, I think I looked online and you can get them like for 60 bucks. I've never bought a real Christmas tree, so I don't know. Center block is five bucks at Lowe's. I checked into that. Uh, you may have to pour some concrete in it. But then you can dump it off into a, a, your fishing hole and you can attract fish. Because we, they, they, we know that they will attract fish. We don't know necessarily what that impact is on the population, but we know that they will attract fish. So it may take a little while for some of those piney those to fall off to really start to attract fish, but you can build your own habitat there. Um, and so some of my future research questions here at UAPB will be, um, how, do, how can we improve fisheries through habitat management? And so some of the strategies we talked about, um, for instance, putting the, the wood in the, the lakes and things like that. Um, what scale? When I talk about scale, how much do we have to do? do we, can, we, can we put one tree into a lake and that makes a difference? Or we have to cover the lake with trees? Um, and is more habitat better? Uh, are there thresholds, so ecological thresholds, something that I'm, I'm kind of interested in as well. But 20% um, seems to be a standard, correct me if I'm wrong, for like ponds and lakes and stuff like that. But if we have 20% coverage, um, that seems to be something that produces, and this gets into fisheries management a little bit, it produces enough cover for um, fish, young fish to hide and survive <laughs> and stuff like that, but it also gives um, enough open area for predator fish to, to consume them. So we have to have that balance there. Um, I hope to do some of this work at UAPB in our pond systems. Um, we can start there and then start to scale up. Um, it's gonna be hard to get 20% coverage at uh, uh, Lake DeGray or Greer's Ferry, but uh, we can at least try to think about these things as we scale up in size. Um, and then also, um, do we have to go to this extreme? So this is a, a picture from ne uh, Nebraska where uh, in order to kind of revert, you remember that little graph we showed you where you come up and you come back down? In order to revert back to a time that we want to get back to, they have to literally go in, drain their whole lakes, dig them back out, because sedimentation in that landscape is so much of a bigger problem, I think, than it is maybe here in certain parts of the state. Now in the Delta, it's probably a pretty big problem, but um, they have to, they've drained their whole lake and they put in these big sedimentation basins here where water's coming in from the, the landscape slows here and it fills in these things and they can scoop them out and things like that. What about streams? Well, we talked a lot about lakes and things like that, um, lakes and reservoirs and those processes and the habitats within them, but um, I'm kind of a river guy. Um, and one thing that's interesting here is I've never been to this system before. I've seen it um, on Google Earth and I've read a little bit about it. Um, anytime you, I hear things like it's the largest system in the world, and it's got really high fish diversity. My ears perk up, and I kind of want to go study it. Um, so this is Bayou Bartholomew. It is the largest bayou system in, in the world, I think. It's not just the United States. I think it's the world. Um, it's very, very, a very large system. Um, and it hasn't had that much development around it. I know early on it's had a lot of agricultural development around it and things like that, but it hasn't. There's no impoundments on it. And it, it has a kind of an, almost like a natural flow cycle for a bayou system. Uh, but one of the major issues is um, sedimentation in the system. That's one thing that Nature Conservancy and folks like that are worried about. Um, and you know, you have some uh, straightening, sh channel straightening in some of the headwaters here in, ag in agricultural lands. Um, and then you have some cattle grazing, which you can't see that very well. These are cattle and kind of headwater streams. And what, what does that do? And you also have kind of construction around Pine Bluff, because Pine Bluff is in the, the headwaters of the system. And so when you have a bunch of construction taking place and runoff, well, you get this really dirty, mucky water compared to something like this. And so that, there's, a, there's a change in habitat right there after a rainstorm. Um, it's just a degree to which that happens is, what, is when we have to have a, um, start thinking about you know, negative biological effects. So I'm really interested in the system. I think it'd be kind of cool to, to go out there and do some research in the system. 
Um, but I talked about sediment and how it, it may be bad, but how is sedimentation, how does it influence fish? Um, any, any, any ideas how sediment influences fish? Covers fish eggs? Oh, I was just a little bit you added compared to those uh, fiscal trees. So oh, yeah. When you throw a fiscal tree in the water, yeah. the fish use those to lay eggs in and they hatch out. Some species will. Yes. Yellow perch will use wood a lot of times. Um, that's not that's not true for all all fishes, but some species will will use wood and trees to, to lay some eggs. You're right. So um, sedimentation. Um, if you have real high levels of sedimentation and high flow, it can cause a lot of uh, issues with the mucus around the fish. You can you know slough mucus off and cause abrasions of the gills and things like that and cause harm to fishes. Um, when I worked in the Colorado River Basin, when you have big monsoonal rains and you pick up a fish after a monsoon's come through and high flooding, they're beat up. They're, they really look rough and it's got sediment is, is, is pounding them. And so, um, so that's one, that's one way that sediment can influence, but it also reduced habitat for invertebrates, the little bugs that fish depend on in those interstitial spaces, it can reduce that habitat. And then it can decrease food in the system, either momentarily or, or over longer temporal periods. But one thing I'm really, um, or I've always thought about with sediment is that it can smother eggs and reduce survival. So here's a, here's your, here's your sediment, or here's your uh, your rocks in your stream, and you got free flowing, you got oxygen here, you got interstitial spaces for, for critters to live, like uh, Doug's trout eggs we saw in that one picture. Well, all the spaces get covered, reduces the amount of habitat available, it smothers the eggs. There's no more oxygen for the egg. And then the, um, it, it dies. Um, one thing that I've really been interested in throughout my career so far is river flow. Um, and talking about kind of going up in scale here. So one thing, we've, we talked a lot about structures and substrates and things like that. One thing we haven't talked about is kind of um, is, is the water itself. And how does that water itself serve as a habitat for fish? Well, they live in it, right? They have, they're completely surrounded 360 degrees by, by water. And so how that water interacts with the fish and with the environment is certainly a big predictor of ecosystem productivity. And uh, when we think about managing systems, we have to think about, especially river systems, we have to think about flow. I think we have to think about flow first. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. Um, so I've done research um, on this topic quite a bit and something I would like to continue to do here, um, is particularly like in the Arkansas River where we have several dams going down the river and looking at how things like um, uh, pulses of flow influence productivity of the system, how fishes grow differently during different years with different flow regimes. So we have more water coming through the system in a given year. Um, what does that um, do to the growth, to the like benthic fishes? Because we have things like the flood pulse concept that maybe some of you have heard of where you have water coming over the landscape brings nutrients into the system, but also the water comes up, floods, flood plains, backwater habitats, those are productive systems, and that can increase fish growth. And so those are all things I'm interested in pursuing here as well. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you coming to my talk.